everyone, and thank you for joining me here on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is DeSoto Brown. I work as the Bishop Museum Historian here in Honolulu, and I'm also the curator for the archives. And today I'm doing a program uh, historically and also looking at things in the modern world to a degree about the automobile here in the Hawaiian Islands. And what I'm going to be talking about is not only the history of how we all became addicted to cars and how we depend on cars for our entire economy to function, but also what the pros and cons are of our addiction to cars. Because there are good things, but there are bad things as well. So first of all, what you're seeing on the screen right now is what a lot of people aspire to, and that is to receive the keys to their own car. This picture happens to have been taken in the 1950s, and the man is receiving the keys to a 1950 Oldsmobile. Well, even though it's an old scene and an old car and everything in it is historic, it still is the way a lot of us feel today. We are unable to function in many ways, in many of the ways that we want to work in our daily lives without a car. And how did we get that way? Well, let's get started and see how we got that way. And here is a historic picture of one of the first cars here in the Hawaiian Islands. This picture is brings up some questions about when did the first cars arrive here? Historically speaking, and based on newspapers of the time period, the first two cars were imported into the Hawaiian Islands and were taken off a ship at Honolulu Harbor in 1899. However, the man in this picture, Mr. Christian J. Hedeman, is sitting in his car, and his family story is that he received this car in 1898. Now, regardless of whether the first car got here in 98 or 99, I can let you know that the development of the automobile had been going on for a long time by then. And it was going on in a number of different countries. And a lot of people probably mistakenly believe that cars were invented in the United States. And that's not true. The first really functional cars were invented in Europe, but it was the United States that really developed the car industry and developed mass production of cars uh, before the rest of the world. So that's why we tend to associate cars with the USA. Regardless of that, here is one of the first cars in the Hawaiian Islands. Now, what people today do not know also, which is historically interesting, the first cars to get here, including the one in this picture, were not internal combustion cars that were run by gasoline. They were electric cars. You may be mistakenly believing that electric cars are a modern invention. They are not. Cars, when they were first invented and people were monkeying around with them in the late 1800s to try to break them, uh, to try to make them usable, really, uh, were powered in three different ways. One, of course, was the internal combustion engine, which runs on gasoline, but also electricity, like this car, and also steam, because steam engines had already been well established, primarily for steam ships and locomotives that pulled trains. So initially, nobody was quite sure how the first cars were really going to be successfully, which, which was going to be the most successful way to run a car. Regardless of that, here's an electric car. Now look at this. It's a very, it's a very rickety looking prototype almost type thing. Very bare bones, very, very plain. It could not go very fast, obviously. It could not go very far on a charge, but it still was more exciting and more useful in many ways than relying on animals because that was the only other way to get around personally. You either walked or you could at this point have ridden a bicycle, but a car had advantages over that as well as using an animal to pull you in a wheeled vehicle. Moving forward in time to about 1905 or so, there have been some big changes. This is a photograph taken in Waikiki. This is Kalakaua Avenue, if you can imagine it, because Waikiki today and Kalakaua Avenue in Waikiki today look very different. That it's in the middle of a very densely populated city, essentially, with a lot of wheeled vehicles, which no longer look like this. The first picture I showed you 
a, a minute or two ago was of a 1950 Oldsmobile. Well, this is a circa 1905 Oldsmobile. This was one of the first successful internal combustion cars. And again, as I just showed you in the previous picture, it's really rudimentary. It mm -hmm. has no roof, it has no sides, it has no windows, it has no windshield. It does not have a steering wheel. You steered this car as well as the previous one with a, what's called a, uh, well, it's, it's basically <laughs> a stick. So you just move a bar back and forth to turn the front wheels. Nobody had thought about a steering wheel yet. This is referred to as a curved dash Oldsmobile, meaning the front of the car is curved upwards. And it only carries two people. The engine is behind the two men, as you see here in this photograph. It's still rickety. It, can, it doesn't move very fast. It doesn't do a heck of a lot. But again, there are advantages, which I'm just about to explain to you, over using the previous and now rapidly becoming archaic forms of transportation. And now we're moving forward in time to 1918, 1919. And as you can see in that interim between the picture from 1905 and this one, cars now look like recognizable cars to us. They have a hood in the front, they have windshields, they have roofs, they have doors, they have windows, they have bumpers, they have headlights, all of the things that we still have in cars today more than 100 years later. But what this photograph demonstrates that's different from now is that at the time, cars were so expensive that this is still a time in which mostly wealthy people could afford them. They had not yet become inexpensive enough for most of the population to have them. And that's demonstrated in this picture because in the back seat of this car is Mrs. Hedeman. I showed you Mr. Hedeman a minute ago. This is Mrs. Hedeman, and she has a chauffeur driving her around. That's because the Hedemans are a wealthy family, and she is in the driveway of her home with her chauffeur-driven car. This car has all the features, again, that we're accustomed to today. And as you can see, there is a steering wheel. And so we've now moved forward to the familiar systems that we use today. Again, however, this is still a wealthy person's mode of transportation. But I mentioned that this is something which was better in many ways than the previous forms of transportation, particularly having a horse-drawn or mule-drawn type of vehicle. And that's because most people could not afford to own a horse. If you lived in the country, you could own a horse and the horse could graze on its own on the land that you lived on because horses have to eat constantly. They are big, strong animals, but what they eat, which is leaves, doesn't provide a lot of energy. So they have to eat constantly. That means that either the horse is grazing on its own and you have land for it to do it, or you have to buy hay and feed the horse the hay that you have bought it. You also, if you are well-to-do enough to own one, have to have a stable for the horse to live in. You have to have somebody who takes care of the horse. You have to have water and food for the horse. You have to clean up the horse manure, which is all over the place. And horses get tired. They're animals. They can't run forever. A car with an engine runs as long as it has fuel. It doesn't get sick. I mean, yes, it sometimes has to get repaired, but unlike a horse, it can go pretty much forever. So that was the advantage of owning a vehicle over a horse. And as time passed, starting particularly in the 1920s, car manufacturing in the United States increased to the point where huge numbers of cars were being made every year. And that meant that they became cheaper. But more importantly, as the new cars came on the market, more and more used cars became available. And used cars, because they were much cheaper, are really the way that cars managed to become what pretty much almost everybody could afford to purchase. And in these three pictures, which are from 1927, 1938, and 1952, you can see that the average person in Hawaii can now afford to own a car. And 
that's what these three pictures demonstrate. So we now have moved into the time which is comparable to today in which lots and lots of people own cars and increasing numbers of people own cars. More and more people come to depend on cars for their daily livelihoods and cars make more and more effects on everybody's lives and the environment that we live in. So what are the advantages of cars? Well, these three scenic pictures are a more sort of romantic way to demonstrate that cars can take you to all kinds of places. As long as there's a road and a road has been built there, you are probably going to be able to drive your car there. Now, these three scenic photographs show the places that you can go to that, yes, truly are scenic here on the island of Oahu. And you can drive your car there. And if you want to go there for recreation or you want to go there to admire the view or whatever you want to do, the car can probably take you there if you can afford the fuel for it. And as I said, as long as a road is there. In order for a road to be there, however, we have to pay taxes to the government to build the roads and also to maintain the roads. So even though you don't think you might be paying directly for a road that you drive on, you are in fact paying for it through various methods of taxation. That's tax on the gasoline that you buy and it's also the cost of registering your car. So we pay for these things. But for most of us, this is something that we think is uh, something we want to pay for because we want to be able to go places. These two graphics show you two aspects of car ownership and driving cars to go to these scenic places I just showed you. On the left is an ad from the 1920s, which is saying you can see the sites of the Hawaiian Islands in your own car. And for many people, for those of us who live here, that is true. We do see these sites from our cars. But another important aspect of car ownership and car usage, I should say, here in Hawaii is rental cars. On the right, the graphic from the 1930s, rent a car, drive it yourself. The rental car business is a major one here because we have so many tourists. Millions of tourists come to the Hawaiian Islands every year. For large quantities of them rent cars. That means that we who live here and who are paying for things also have to deal with a lot of tourists driving here in rental cars too. And rental cars are a big business. They are part of our economy along with tourism in general that helps support us, but also gives us, makes us deal with things that we may not want to deal with such as traffic congestion. Now here on Oahu, that's not as much of a big deal with rental cars, but on other islands where there are fewer roads, more tourists clogging up roads that, use, that are used by local people, that is a source of friction and anger sometimes. Cars also have an aspect of not only entertainment and amusement, but recreation. So it isn't just that you get to drive someplace and look at pretty views. Cars are used by people, one, to show their status, because the car that you drive shows sometimes how much money you have. But cars also vary in how fast they are and how big they are and what they can do. People also buy cars that are oversized to show, again, that they're big and powerful and that they have money. But cars that drive fast can be used for racing. And this photograph shows a car race on the island of Maui in the early 1960s, 1960 or 61. The cars that you see here on this pavement, and by the way, this is a disused, uh, what was a military uh, airport or a military airstrip, which is no longer in use, that they were able to use for cars to drive around on. Some of the cars that you see here are cars which could be used for daily driving. But some of the others, particularly the ones in the right in the front that we're looking at, are race cars. They're not to be driven around when you want to go to the grocery store or go to the beach. These are cars just to go fast. Car racing 
is again a form of recreation that a lot of people like and unfortunately under controlled conditions like this under a car race everything is all right but people drive fast in fast cars on the public roads where you're not supposed to be racing fortunately they do it anyway and sometimes with terrible effects and we'll see those in the min in a minute but again this is being here just to show you that yes cars serve a recreational uh role as well cars or let me just say motorized vehicles are also important in other industries and this photograph which is from the 1960s shows sugar cane harvesting now sugar cane the growing and refining of sugarcane was the major foundation of the Hawaiian Islands uh, economy for a great many years. And unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, it's completely gone today. And there are no fields of sugarcane anymore. There is no sugarcane harvesting. The sugar mills do not function anymore. Most of them are gone. But during the time that sugar was an industry, cars and motor vehicles were also introduced to it and they made a big difference there too what you see in this picture is how sugar harvesting gradually came to be dominated by machines originally sugar cane was cut by hand that meant you had to have a lot of people out in the field who went around with a machete in their hand and cut the stalk of every sugar cane stalk at its base. Then they had to gather those stalks up and load them onto either wagons that were pulled by animals to put them in what were called flumes, which is upright uh, structures that had running water in them that carried cut sugarcane down to the mill. Or more frequently, they had small railroads which carried the cut sugarcane to the mill. Well, all of that became superseded in the 1930s by the use of these vehicles here. It was possible to just simply go into the field, bulldoze the sugarcane, bring in cranes that you see here that literally picked up all these bundles of sugar and then dumped them into huge trucks like the one in the center. All of that meant that not only did you replace all the people and animals that had formerly been used, but you also made the job much easier. So sugar workers actually benefited a great deal from not having to go into fields and cut sugar cane by hand and load it by hand. It made the process much less difficult, much less onerous, and much less literally painful than it had been. Okay, those are mostly positive things that we've looked at, but now, Let's look at the other parts of car ownership and car usage that are not necessarily good. As I said earlier, cars today are mostly powered by fuel that comes from petroleum or oil. Oil is formed naturally. Oil is underground on earth. Oil gets pumped up to the surface and then it gets refined into the types of fuel that we burn to make energy. In this picture, in the, in the screen, you see on the left a photograph of a local oil refinery. This is at Campbell Industrial Park on the island of Oahu. We have refineries because we use so much fuel. We can take oil that hasn't been refined and turn it into the fuel that we need. Well, well that's fine, except that is a source of pollution. And I'm going to talk more about that in the, as we go along. Burning oil causes pollution. Handling oil, handling fuel also, th there are dangers to that too. In the picture on the right, taken in the early 1950s, you see the standard oil facility in Honolulu. And in the foreground is a large tanker truck that is going to be carrying fuel to a place where it is needed. And for most of what we're talking about, that's going to be gasoline that is being taken to individual gas stations where then cars, privately owned cars, can get gas. And 
This whole infrastructure of not only refining oil and transporting fuels, but also creating gas stations for the public to be able to fuel their cars is something that had to be created in the early part of the 20th century because it didn't exist before that. We are very familiar with gas stations. Interestingly, and this picture that we're looking at here is a gas station in Kaka'ako in the 1950s. There was a time, even into the 1970s and 80s, where there were far more gas stations than there are now. We've lost a number of those stations. The other thing that you see in this picture is that gas stations for many, many years didn't just provide gasoline. They also fixed, repaired cars. They installed things in cars. You went here to get your car fixed rather than taking it to the dealer. One of the reasons that has died out is because cars today are so complicated to fix. They have so much electronics and they have so many computer aspects to them that they can't be fixed at independent gas stations anymore. What is the downside of having a lot of gas stations? Well, on the upside, it's easy to find a gas station to get gas for your car. But the downside is every one of these stations has to have an underground tank holding gasoline, which is brought to it by the tanker truck that I just showed you in the previous picture. Every one of those underground tanks is a potential danger if it leaks. And we have just recently been through the leaking of the fuel tanks at Red Hill owned by the U.S. military and how that was a major source of contamination to the water that we need to survive, to drink. Well, every one of the gas stations is potentially a source of this underground type of fuel leakage and pollution and damage to our water table. So this is something that's not good. And of course, oil and its products are flammable. That's why we use it. We burn it. An internal combustion engine literally ignites gasoline, which explodes as an aerosol, meaning as fine part particles in an air, a chamber containing air and a spray of gasoline. A spark ignites that. That's what makes our cars run. This flammable fuel can also lead to catastrophes on a big scale. In the picture on the left, you see a fire in an oil tank in Honolulu, next to Honolulu Harbor and next to Nimitz Highway in about 1980. And this fire badly injured or killed at least one firefighter. These types of fires can be even worse if more than one fuel tank is ignited. And not only is that a fire that's very difficult to put out, and not only does it produce a huge amount of very polluting smoke, as you can see, this black smoke, but also if the tank becomes hot enough if, if a tank is burning and the ones around it become hot enough, they can literally explode and that can be absolutely catastrophic. In the picture on the right, you see what had been a gasoline tanker and most of it is burned to almost nothing. It's just the metal framework of the vehicle. This was a tanker that had a crash on the H1 freeway in the late 1970s. It skidded on its side. The tank ruptured. The sparks caused by the skidding ignited the gasoline. This created a huge fire. In this picture, the fire's been put out and the firefighters are around the destroyed truck. But in the distance, you can see huge clouds of smoke. That's because the flaming, burning gasoline from this crash ran down into the drains along the H1 freeway and caused fires all throughout that drain system, particularly where it was opened up to the open air for other, other locations for water to drain into it. So this catastrophic fire spread for a long distance. You can see in that picture how far off in the distance that fire is. Fortunately, it didn't cause major disaster. It didn't cause a lot of other fires, no injuries or death. But again, we live with this danger without thinking about it. We accept it as something that's just part of life. And yet the fuel that we need 
for our cars can do this to us. In addition to big fires due to oil or petroleum, there also are small fires. Individual vehicles catch on fire. Usually it's not because the gas tank ignites in the vehicle. It's because engines run very hot. As I explained, gasoline is constantly being ignited and exploding inside your engine. That makes it really hot. And sometimes that heat can cause the rest of the car to catch on fire. This is a Volkswagen van that burned in the 1970s on the H1 freeway in Kahala. And you see the firefighters putting out the fire. Now, most of us think of cars as being metal objects, and that's because the car body is metal. And metal doesn't easily burn, but in fact, cars are full of flammable plastic. Cars have flammable tires on them, and they will burn. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about is the advantages and disadvantages of electric cars. Electric cars don't run with, and create hugely hot temperatures because they're not igniting flammable gasoline. So they don't burn in exactly the same way. But the downside is when they do burn, they burn even more fiercely and strongly than gasoline powered cars. And they're also far more difficult to extinguish if they catch on fire. So here's the story about electric cars. Remember I said that the first cars that ever came here were electric? Well, for a long time, electricity died out for the use of transportation for individual vehicles. There were, of course, golf carts that are powered electrically. There were uh, forklifts that were used industrially, industrially that, were parked, that were powered electrically. But it wasn't until the Tesla cars that you see in the picture on the left in the Tesla store in Waikiki at the International Marketplace, it wasn't until they came on the market that electric cars really began to make inroads into the sales of regular everyday vehicles. Tesla had and still has to a degree kind of a special aura to it because of the uniqueness of the car, because of how Elon Musk was groundbreaking, how Teslas were not meant to just be everyday cars, but special cars that went extremely fast. And thus, for a lot of people, they were very desirable. Of course, now there are many other makes of electric cars. And you can tell when you drive around by looking for the license plates that you see here on the right that say electric vehicle, because many vehicles don't look any different. You can't tell by looking at a car necessarily whether it's powered by gasoline or electricity. What's the advantage of an electric car over a gasoline car? Well, one of the advantages and the reason that electric cars are being pushed today to a lot of political turmoil is that they do not emit fumes. They don't emit CO2. Each, each gasoline powered car is putting out CO2. It's which causes, uh, which is one of the main reasons, which is the main reason for global warming. And global warming is not an insignificant thing. And we're seeing it more and more as life is going on, as the effects are being made obvious. So gasoline cars are putting out CO2, but electric cars are not. They're not giving off any exhaust whatsoever. So they're not contributing to that. Where does the electricity come from, however? Well, the electricity is coming from, at least for us here, burning fuels. So the power plant is generating CO2. However, the advantage in that is that you can do more to control the emissions from a power plant than you can from lots of individual vehicles. And furthermore, it is becoming increasingly possible to generate electricity without burning fuel. So in a, in a fantasy world, electricity would be created by purely natural means from the sun and from tides and from wind. And then it would go into the electric cars, which wouldn't be putting out any CO2. We're not there yet. And I'm not sure we will get there. And there are a lot of other questions too. 
nonetheless, we probably are seeing a future where more and more of us will be driving electric cars. And even though right at this moment, in June of 2024, there is uh, some downside to car sales, electric car sales. We'll see how long that lasts. What are the other downsides of cars in our environment, in our lives? Well, first of all, cars are big things. They take up space. <laughs> They're not small. You have to create space for cars. And one of the ways that we have to do this is by building parking lots. So by the 1950s, when this photograph was taken, there were enough cars in the Hawaiian Islands that there had to be a lot of parking lots for them. This is the Times supermarket in Kahala under construction in the middle 1950s. And the parking lot in the foreground is much bigger than the supermarket itself. So cars are requiring more room than the function of the actual store, the actual food that humans require. That's where we get it. But our cars take up more room than the food store does. Here's a picture of Ala Moana Center in about 1970. And here you clearly see that the central part of the structure is where the stores are. That's where people go and buy stuff. All around it, a huge amount of parking. Ala Moana, of course, since 1970, when this picture was taken, has grown considerably. And so there are a lot more stores and there's a lot more to that. And even though a lot of this open space that you see here is now built on, there are actually a lot more parking spaces at Ala Moana now than there were when this picture was taken. And that's because an entire high-rise building has been built to accommodate cars and all the other things that are going on in here that people need to drive their cars to Ala Moana for. So again, very clearly, all the space we have to use to accommodate automobiles. And that space is not just used when a car is parked. Cars are parked most of the time. Cars are not driven that frequently. But when they are driven, they require roads. And as there are more and more cars, we need more and more roads. These two pictures show the airport viaduct of the H1 freeway. The picture on the right, taken in the 1970s, when it was under construction, and the picture on the left, taken in the middle, early to middle 1980s, when this interchange was finished and the whole airport viaduct was completed. Look at the size of these structures. Look at how much concrete there is. Look at the width, how wide that interchange is. We don't even think about it. This has been here for 40 years. Nobody gives it any thought. But look at the amount of work, the amount of money we spent, and how massive all this is to accommodate the cars that we drive. And this is, let's, on it, let's be honest, this is despoiling the landscape. But we accept it because we need our cars. And when cars are on, these huge roadways, they're doing a lot of other bad stuff. And in this view of the H1 freeway in the 1970s, you can see that there are buildings right next to the freeway. If you live or work in one of those buildings, you are suffering from the effects of cars. And it's not just the obvious ones. We know that car exhaust is dangerous. It can kill you. Carbon monoxide can take your life. Sometimes people intentionally kill themselves with carbon monoxide from an internal combustion engine. Secondly, CO2 doing damage to the environment. But when you're right next to the freeway or any big road, you're also constantly being barraged by noise from passing vehicles. Partly it's the noise of the engine of the car it's certainly the noise of the muffler of the car on the exhaust because there are people who intentionally make their mufflers loud. It's also the noise of passing emergency vehicles with sirens, ambulances, police cars, and fire vehicles. 
but there's also the sound of tires on the pavement. And most of us don't think about that. That sound is made even louder when it's wet because the tires are making more noise running on wet pavement. And also, we're all familiar with the black soot that settles on everything around the freeway. We tend to believe incorrectly that that comes from exhaust. It's not. It's coming from tires being worn as they drive on the surface. Because every time a tire is rolling on pavement, tiny particles are constantly being torn off of it. They're small enough to go up into the air and gradually settle back down. So not only are we breathing these tiny particles of tires, they're settling on everything and making everything dirty. Do you want to live next to the freeway? No, you don't. Those are the reasons why you don't. But those are the negative parts of vehicles. And this picture was taken over 50 years ago of the freeway. But guess what? It still looks like this. And the problem is that more traffic, more vehicles means more traffic congestion. And then we tend to say we need to build more roads. Fortunately, we now have a train running on Oahu. That's another whole huge subject, but that's going to help keep a lid to some degree on the number of cars that are going to be coming in. And they're never going to stop, unfortunately. Another really bad aspect of cars is what you see right here. Cars kill and injure us all the time. Today, we are talking a lot about self-driving cars, cars that in theory will not be subject to the mistakes that humans make when we drive cars, but theoretically will cut the level of accidents, therefore cutting the level of injuries and deaths. We're not there yet. And in fact, the technology in some cases, is leading to accidents, regardless of whether a car is driven by a machine, a computer, or a human. Each one of these vehicles moving independently sometimes runs into another vehicle, runs into an object, runs into a person, and this is the result. And again, as I said, here's the bad side. It's not just destruction. It's not just costing money. It's injuring and killing people all the time. And again, this is something we just accept as part of our modern lives and we don't even find fault with, but it is a tragedy. And we're not going to ever lose that. Deaths because of vehicles are never going to go away, regardless of the technology, regardless of else, what else happens. And thousands of people have been killed in the Hawaiian Islands since 1906, which was the first fatal car crash, which happened on Oahu. Thousands, probably as many as 5,000 people have lost their lives and innumerable others have been injured. And as I just said, cars are not going to go away unless there's some absolute catastrophe that destroys the economy of the entire globe, we're still going to be relying upon cars. We can't function without them. They are in fact crucial for our economy to function. Therefore, we can't escape them. And all we, have to, all we can do is live with them and the huge amounts of them that there are in ways that will make our lives better, not worse. Technology is going to help but there's also going to have to be a lot of adjustments in how people function. And voluntarily, we're not going to give up our cars. We're only going to do it if we're forced. And we're forced because we can't get fuel. We're forced because we can't afford it. But other than that, we will make sacrifices to keep our cars running and for us to keep driving them and using them. When a car is no longer functional, it goes from being the symbol of mobility to being the symbol of pollution and immobility. A car that no longer runs is suddenly a huge object 
that you have to deal with. Cars that are just left to fall apart contribute more, again, to the pollution that I've been talking about earlier. And this picture taken on Maui in the 1960s shows you very clearly what I mean. And not only are they doing bad stuff to the environment, they look terrible. And that brings us to the end, literally, of these two cars that you see here, which are abandoned and are eyesores and are something that we have to deal with. But also the fact that cars use a tremendous amount of resources from the earth to be made. They use resources to be run. And then they are a terrible problem to have to deal with once they no longer function. Do I have the answer for all these things? No, I don't. And fortunately, I'm, it's not in my hands to have to fix all this. But these are things to keep in mind as to when we when you when these uh, discussions come up, because they are going on right now. How do we deal with cars? How do we deal with pollution? How do we deal with global warming? Because cars are one of the major parts of global warming. And how do we deal with all these other things? So keep all the bad things in mind in addition to the good things that we need our cars for and we enjoy our cars for. Thanks very much for joining me. I'm DeSoto Brown. Thanks for being here with me on Think Tech Hawaii. I will continue to be making programs and I look forward for you to be seeing more of me here on Think Tech. So till next time, everybody, aloha.